right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the last week of class for at least this uh, ME 564 class. And then uh, we'll have a big, nice break. We'll think about everything we've learned, and we'll start uh, again with 565 in January. Um, so this is kind of a good place to be in. I've taught you basically everything I wanted to tell you for the first uh, half of the sequence. And this last week is kind of interesting extra stuff. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about um, this week are essentially an interesting type of solutions to a PDE called Laplace's equation. So we're already going to start getting into partial differential equations, and we're going to talk about very uh, important solutions to Laplace's equation that involve uh, potential fluid flows. Okay, And what I'm hoping to do is build the theory today and on Wednesday, and then on Friday go through a full in-depth uh, MATLAB example that kind of integrates all of the things we've talked about in the class so far. So we're going to use PDEs to define a vector field. Then we're going to integrate particles through the vector field you know, using that induced ODE. Uh, and we're going to understand when the particles become chaotic uh, and what that looks like for engineering design. OK, so that's what we're going to do for the next three lectures. Uh, there's no homeworks on this. The exam won't cover this week. Um, the exam will be cumulative up until the last lecture. And I can't remember when it was, because we've been gone for a week. Um, speaking of which, I hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving. Um, all right, so before I start, I think that I should give you all maybe 15 or 20 minutes to ask any questions you want about the final exam. So the final exam will come out on Wednesday. I'll probably post it after my office hours at 11.30 in the morning. And it'll be due on at Friday at about 4 or 5 p.m. I haven't quite decided. Maybe 4 p.m. so that we have time to pick it up and leave. Uh, OK, any, any questions at all about the final exam? Yeah? That's this Wednesday. This, this Wednesday, Wednesday, two days from now, not the, fin not, not the last week of this week. Two days from now, I'll hand out the final um, online. Yeah? Do you have our old comments in your office? My TAs have the old homeworks, um, so Scott Wilcox has, I think, been collecting all of them. Yep. Yeah. So I wrote the final two days ago, and I don't remember putting any MATLAB examples on. But I do have some numerical analysis examples, like finite difference derivatives, Taylor series, order of error, things like that. So I have things that are related to MATLAB, but I don't think I have any actual coding. Let me check. I don't remember. I don't think so. Um, let me make sure that this isn't going to broadcast. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I don't have any MATLAB on the final. Um, OK, it looks like it's all by hand so far. Yep, it's all by hand. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when was homework five was due on Monday? Last Monday, then probably. Um, I'll, I'll ask my TAs. I'll see him tomorrow. Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Four hour time demand to do this. Or? So I think it's about four hours. Um, what I would highly recommend all of you do is try to take it in two hours and then use the other two hours, you know, to get the rest of the. So act like it's a two hour exam, even though it's a four hour exam, to prepare for the qualifying exams. Okay, so the calls are two hours and they have more stuff on them. So I'm giving you four hours because I don't want time to be the, the constraining, you know, factor for this exam. But you really should be able to take it in two hours. But I'm going to give you four. Um, it's a little longer and it's a little harder, but not a lot longer or a lot harder. OK? But everything you know, is curved, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just do your best. OK, other questions about the exam, more content-driven questions. Okay, it seems like everyone's super confident and ready for the final exam. <laughs> Are we sure? No more questions? Okay, good. That's all. Um, 
So we'll talk a little bit more um, about actual math then. So I'm super, super, super excited about the next half of this class, ME565. It's going to start in January. Um, I'm skipping an amazing, beautiful conference in uh, West Palm Beach, just so I can be here for the first lecture of class and not uh, not deliver a pre-recorded video lecture. That's how excited I am. Um, and the entire idea for this next class that we're going to talk about is partial differential equations. Okay, so we've talked a lot about ordinary differential equations where we have something like, uh, this by the way is not what I plan to tell you about today. Um, so we've talked a lot about ordinary differential equations like x dot equals a times x or x dot equals f of x. Um, these are kind of ordinary differential equations because we have one state variable and we're just taking a single time derivative with respect to the independent variable of time. Okay, So we have x of t where x is the dependent variable, t is the independent variable, and we're only taking derivatives with respect to t. So these are ODEs. Now, for PDEs, we're going, we've already actually seen certain types of PDEs in the class, um, and that's why we've been learning about vector calculus, is because this is the language that we're going to use to describe partial differential equations. Um, partial differential equations would be something like partial x, let's say I have some function u, and I'm taking the partial derivative of u with respect to time, and let's say that that equals some constant times the partial of u with respect to x. So now u is a function of x and time. Okay, so this is what, I'm just setting up the, the notation here. So u is a function of x and time, and the way that, what that really means is that if I have some spatial coordinate x, then u could have some, u is some function of x, and this function is changing in time. Okay? And what the partial differential equation does is it constrains how this function has to behave over time. It tells me you know, something about how it changes in time with respect to its variation in the spatial domain. For example, this U could be the temperature on a piece of steel beam, and I might be applying some heat here and here with a blowtorch. Okay? That's, this is not the equation for heat on a beam, but... Um, the idea here with a partial differential equation is now I'm taking some function u, which is a function of multiple variables, and I'm writing down partial derivatives in a constraint equation. Okay, and we already just derived us one partial differential equation for mass continuity using Gauss's law. Okay, that was that density equation we wrote down. And the entire point of the next class, ME565, is going to be to analyze partial differential equations that come up all the time in engineering. So heat equations, wave equations, fluid equations, elastic equations. Um, we'll talk about Schrodinger's, Schrodinger, Schrodinger's equation for quantum mechanics, um, optics, all kinds of neat stuff. Okay, But it really all rests on this idea of a partial differential equation. Um, and we've already seen some partial differential equations we're going to talk about more today. Um, something else that's important to note um, is that we're going to be talking about different coordinate systems that make these PDEs easier to solve. Okay, so remember with the ODE, we had x dot equals a times x. And so we would choose a different coordinate system defined by the eigenvectors of A, so we would say let's choose a new coordinate system that's written in the eigenvector coordinates of the matrix A, and in this new coordinate system we have something much simpler which is um, essentially that the dynamics are diagonal, remember? So a nice change of coordinates, this is a change of coordinates, So with an appropriate change of coordinates, we took a relatively complicated coupled ODE and we turned it into a really, really simple decoupled diagonal ODE that was very easy to solve. 
And this is going to be a huge theme of the next class 565, where we're going to be looking at uh, clever changes of coordinates that make our partial differential equations much, much easier to solve. And that's going to be uh, the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. Okay, so Fourier and Laplace transforms are going to be super important uh, for PDEs because they're going to give us a really nice coordinate system where the PDE is actually simple and sometimes diagonal. Um, we're also going to learn a lot about data science. Okay, so we're going to be talking about methods uh, in data reduction and pattern, essentially pattern extraction from data, so that if you have an experiment that's collecting lots and lots of data, and you know that it's governed by some underlying partial differential equation, you can use data science methods like what Google and Facebook and Netflix are using to extract patterns from that data to, again, find a change of coordinates into a low dimensional basis where you can solve the system. Okay, so um, this is all stuff we will be talking about uh, next quarter. I'm just really excited about it and I want to give you kind of a, like a sneak peek into what we're talking about. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a very, very super important PDE called Laplace's equation. And this, uh, we're going to introduce it in a physically motivating way using potential flow. Okay, so how many of you have heard of potential flow before? Okay, how many of you have had some complex variable theory, like, um, you know, complex functions, taking the derivatives of complex functions, analytic functions, things like that? Okay, so we're going to do this, uh, again, in the first week of the next class, but I'm going to give you a little bit um, of a head start in that. So last couple of lectures we learned about Gauss's theorem and Stokes's theorem, right? And what we're going to use Stokes' theorem and Gauss' theorem for now is to come up with a constraint equation or a partial differential equation that describes a very special type of fluid. So we're going to consider a fluid that is incompressible and irrotational. Okay, so incompressible. and irrotational. And we're going to call that a fluid vector field V. Okay, so V is this vector field that defines, you know, my fluid velocity at every point in space. So if you like, V is a function of X and T. And we're going to say a few things about this fluid flow. So first of all, it's steady, which means that partial V partial T equals zero. Meaning it's not really a function of time. It's just a function of space. Okay? The partial derivative of my vector field with respect to time is zero. It's not changing in time. Okay? Um, it's also incompressible. So what did we, what does incompressible mean in vector calculus terms? Say again? Yeah, divergence is zero, so the div of V equals zero. And let's say that this vector field V has two components, V1 and V2. So it's just a fluid velocity in 2D. Okay, it's a 2D fluid velocity. Okay, so it's incompressible. And I'm not sure if I told you what irrotational means, but based on the name irrotational, no rotation, what would that be in vector calculus terms? Curl is equal to zero. So curl of V is also equal to zero. Okay, so these are the three conditions that I'm going to impose on this, this velocity field. And it seems pretty restrictive, right? I'm actually putting a lot of constraints on this, uh, this vector field V. But this type of fluid flow that's incompressible, irrotational, and steady was enough to get us about to the 1950s in terms of airplane design. Okay, so you can really build a very practical airplane using these constrained equations for a fluid flow. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But these are actually pretty, pretty general um, 
And if you relax this first condition one, you can actually go about two decades farther and get into helicopter theory. OK, so what does incompressible mean in vector calculus? That just means that partial v1 partial x plus partial, so partial v1 partial x plus partial v2 partial y equals 0. And curl of v equals 0 means that uh, partial v2 partial x minus partial v1 partial y equals 0. OK? So these are the two constraints that we have on v. And what I'm going to show you is that these are definitely both satisfied for a special type of vector function v. Here, I'll show you. Um, so if v equals the gradient of some potential, and this potential satisfies Laplace's equation, so and phi satisfies Laplace's equation, which is the second Laplacian of phi equals 0. Then V satisfies uh, conditions 2 and 3. OK, so first I need to tell you what Laplace's equation is and why it's important. Then I need to show you that if V is defined as a gradient field with of a potential phi that satisfies Laplace's equation, that it does, in fact, have incompressibility and irrotational properties. OK, so what do I mean by the Laplacian, the, the, OK, so del squared is called the Laplacian. And it's kind of like, um, well, it's exactly equal to the divergence of the gradient of something. OK, so Laplacian of phi is the divergence of the gradient of phi. So Laplacian of phi is the divergence of the gradient of phi. And that's equal to um, the divergence of partial phi partial x partial phi partial y, partial phi partial z. We're just in 2D, so I'm only going to do partial x and partial y. And the divergence of this vector field is, OK, I take the first term and I take partial with respect to x again, so partial squared phi, partial x squared. And then I add the partial of the second term with respect to y, plus partial squared phi, partial y squared. OK, so let's think about what we're doing here. Phi is a scalar function. Phi is just a function of x, scalar function. OK, so phi is a scalar function. But if I take the gradient of phi, then I get a vector field, right? Anytime I take the gradient of a scalar function, I get a vector field, because it's you know, partial phi, partial x, partial phi, partial y. It's a vector field now. And if I take the divergence of that gradient field, I get another scalar field, right? Because the divergence of any vector is just a scalar. And this del squared phi is given by the sum of the partials, the square partial in x plus the second partial derivative in y of my function phi. So how many of you have seen this Laplacian before, del squared? OK, I'm not going to harp on this. And the idea is that if this equals 0, then we have this equation equals 0. This is a partial differential equation. Okay, I have partial, so there's some function phi, 
that I'm trying to solve for possibly. And I know that its second partial derivative in x plus its second partial derivative in y has to equal 0. Okay, so this is a PDE called Laplace's equation. It's the same as this PDE here. This is just the way to write it in terms of vector calculus. So Laplace was a big deal. Um, he did some of the best mathematics. And um, how many of you have visited the Eiffel Tower? So I was pretty surprised uh, to find when I visited there that they actually honor their great mathematicians by putting their names on their monuments, which is kind of a novel idea. Um, so Laplace's name is prominently posted on the Eiffel Tower. That's uh, how important Laplace is. Um, OK, so what I'm going to show you now is that if my vector field v is defined by the gradient of a scalar potential, and that scalar potential satisfies Laplace's equation, then we satisfy incompressibility and irrotationality. That's what I'm going to show you now. Okay. So, um, okay. So if v equals v1, v2, and it equals grad phi, then that equals partial phi, partial x, and partial phi, partial y. Right? I'm saying that my vector field is the gradient of phi, which means that v1 is partial phi, partial x and v2 is partial phi, partial y. Okay, So v1 partial phi, partial x, v2 is partial phi, partial y. And now what we're going to see is that, OK, remember that the divergence of v has to be 0. So divergence of v is partial v1, partial x, plus partial v2 partial y. And now I'm going to plug in this and this for v1 and v2. So I get partial squared v1 partial x squared plus partial v2 squared, sorry, phi, partial y squared. And this is the Laplacian of phi which we said has to be 0. OK? So divergence of v is definitely equal to 0 if v is given by the gradient of phi, and phi satisfies Laplace's equation. OK? So this was condition 2. Condition 3 is that the curl of v has to equal 0. And the curl of v is uh, partial v2 partial x minus partial v1 partial y. OK. Now, what was v2? Partial v partial y. So I'm going to take that partial deriv derivative with respect to x as uh, partial squared phi partial y and partial x. OK. And minus v1 is partial phi partial x. And I'm taking the partial of it with respect to y. So I get partial squared phi partial x partial y. And these are equal and opposite, and they cancel. So this also equals 0. OK. so. Let me take a step back. If I just wanted my vector field v to be irrotational, to have curl equals 0, all I need is for v to be the gradient of any potential phi. We have this, this fundamental identity that the curl of the gradient of phi is always equal to 0 for all phi. Right? This is one of those vector identities that you can, you can expand this out, and you can compute the curl, and you'll find that this is always equal to 0, no matter what phi is. You don't even have to specify what phi is. This is always equal to 0. So the, the condition of v being irrotational is easy to satisfy. I just need 
my vector field to be a gradient field. Okay? But the additional constraint of incompressibility is not automatically satisfied for all gradient fields. It's only satisfied for gradient fields that satisfy this Laplace's equation. Okay? And this is how you could derive Laplace's equation if you want. You could say, let V be a gradient field. And if I go through all of the math and I say, I want that gradient field to have divergence zero, then I would find that my vector potential phi has to satisfy Laplace's equation for that to be equal to zero. Okay? So this is a super useful equation, Laplace's equation. And if phi satisfies Laplace's equation, then the gradient field defined by phi is a potential flow. It's a flow that is incompressible and irrotational and steady. And fortunately, it's mathematically simple enough that we can actually do analysis on this. We can actually solve this equation on pencil and paper by hand, which is what made this so useful for airplanes. So this is why we could build airplanes before computers. So real fluid flows are not incompressible or irrotational. But we make this approximation because the flows that we're flying through at low speeds at the early stage of airplanes actually satisfy these approximations. And Laplace's equation is much, much easier to solve than the full Navier-Stokes equations for a viscous fluid. But to do real airplanes at real you know, high Mach numbers and with real drag, you would need computers to solve those equations. Okay, so this is an approximation. We make these constraints on our equations. We know that they're not exactly true, but they're good enough to build real airplanes. And these constraints give me Laplace's equation. Which is probably the simplest PDE that we can actually solve. This is one of the simplest PDEs. Okay, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how to solve this PDE in the next course with lots of methods by hand and computational. Um, but for now, I'm just going to show you some of the neat things about this, this system. Um, okay, are there any questions about what we're doing here before I go on to some examples? Yeah. Uh, property of vector fields that the curl of the grad of phi is zero. Yeah, for any phi. Uh, but you said the real fluids don't always uh, satisfy the irrotationality property. Right. So is there an underlying assumption that we make? Yeah, yeah, so real fluid flows are not given by the gradient of some potential. So, so, so there's kind of two types of vector fields. Uh, let's see if I can draw this. We don't need Laplace's equation anymore. So, okay, so there are, let's draw like a diagram of, let's say that in the universe there are vector fields. Okay? So, a subset of these vector fields are, and let's call these V. So some of these vector fields are solutions to PDEs, okay? A smaller subset of these vector fields are the gradient of some potential, okay? And an even smaller subset of these vector fields satisfy V equals grad phi and the Laplacian of phi equals zero. So this is kind of where we're living right now, is in this red circle of very, very restricted flows. So of all possible vector functions you can name, you could name tons of vector functions, right? One vector function is for every point in space, pick a random vector. That's a vector field. But it doesn't satisfy any nice PDEs that I'm aware of. Okay, 
Then there are vector fields that are the solution of real PDEs, like the heat equation or fluid flow or elastic equations. Those are vector fields that are the solution of PDEs. A more restrictive class of vector fields V that satisfy V equals grad phi, these are irrotational. Okay, so irrotational or conservative fields are vector fields V that equal the gradient of some scalar potential. So gravitation is an irrotational flow. Um, Coulomb's force potential defines an irrotational vector field. Potential flow defines a special irrotational vector field that's also incompressible. Okay? So these are kind of also get more and more difficult to solve. Okay, good question. Uh, other questions about what we're talking about? Yeah? I'm sorry? For a field to be like dissipated? That's a good question. Um, No, that's a good question. Um, so, I'm trying to think if I have a simple answer. Um, so, the dissipation is often what gives rise to, like, it produces rotation in the flow. Um, I'm not sure if it's strictly necessary. Yeah, I can actually have uh, a purely non dissipative flow that does have rotation with Euler's equation. So, Euler's equation is the Navier-Stokes equation without dissipation, and it still has convection of rotation as long as you started with some vorticity. So you can think about these things when you're stirring up cream in your coffee. That's like a good place to start thinking about rotational vector fields uh, and curl. Um, if you're really careful and you're drinking soup or eating soup or whatever you do to soup, and you have your spoon. You can take your spoon and you can drag it slowly through your soup. And if it's a viscous enough soup, you can get potential flow, um, a recirculation zone behind your spoon of counter-rotating vorticity. And then if you drag your spoon faster, you'll actually get periodic vortex shedding in the Karman vortex street. So how does that look uh, if you're really stirring your soup super fast, then you'll get vortex shedding behind your spoon. Um, and if you go much faster, then the soup will spill out. I can't get much higher than, uh, than vortex shedding. Okay, um, other questions about potential flow or Laplace's equation or irrotational flow? Okay, so having no rotation is easy to satisfy. You just need your vector field to be the gradient of some potential. Then this will always be true. Incompressibility is harder to satisfy. You need that scalar function phi to also satisfy Laplace's equation. Okay, that's the big upshot here. Okay, good. So I want to tell you a little bit more about Laplace's equation and give you some examples of where we use Laplace's equation. Okay. So Laplace's equation is del squared phi equals zero. So this is a really, really important PDE in partial differential equations in uh, complex analysis. So I'm going to give you four examples of where this comes up in physics, um, just so that you can have in your mind like why this is important. So this comes up in gravitation. Um, and an example is, let's say I have the Earth. Okay, 
And we know that my force field is equal to minus the gradient of some potential energy uh, P, where P is minus uh, mass mg over the radius. Okay, so we have some potential energy for some, you know, point mass m out here. And it's in inverse proportion to the radius from the center of the Earth. And so you can verify by hand that the Laplacian of p equals zero. So this is actually a good exercise to do by hand. Take this function. If you like, you can just call this some constant over r. And you can verify uh, that the Laplacian of this potential function, the gravitational potential, is equal to 0. And that means a couple of important things. This is actually true away from the center of the Earth. Okay, so this is true away from uh, masses. What I'm going to call mass sources. So away from sources of mass. So in the solar system, for example, you have all of these planetary bodies and moons. And as long as you're not sitting inside of one of them, this equation is true for the gravitational potential of all of those masses. And you can verify this by hand. Okay? So this means a few things. This means, for example, that out here, you don't actually feel any divergence. Right? All of the vectors are pointing basically towards the Earth, so there's no divergence away from the mass. There's also no rotation. Okay? So that's what this means, is that the vector field has no divergence and no rotation away from the center. And so we have lots of things we can say about Stokes' theorem and Gauss's theorem. So what are some things we could say? Like, if I was on a roller coaster with no friction in a gravitational field, conservation of energy would hold. Okay, so for curl-free vector fields, we have cons conservation of energy. Okay, another example is electrostatics. Um, it's basically the same as gravitation. This is away from point charges. So this is super similar to gravitation, except your forces are opposite. So if I have a couple of point charges, then they define a vector field. And as long as I'm not sitting directly on one of those singular point sources, then Laplace's equation is going to hold. OK? So notice that the only points that actually have positive divergence are at these sources of mass and charge. Okay, so I can have points that have positive divergence, but everywhere else in this field, I have uh, no divergence and no rotation. Okay, maybe the more interesting examples are heat transfer. So let's talk about how many of you are taking a heat transfer class right now? Maybe there's none offered. Um, OK, so the heat transfer is probably the easiest one to think about because this one's actually intuitive. We can reason through what the solution is without any math, just from physical intuition. So let's think about heat conduction. And in particular, we're going to talk about steady state heat conduction. So we're going to have a variable T, which is temperature. And one of the things we're, that we're going to derive in the next uh, half of this class is the heat equation. So the change in temperature with respect to time is given by 
some constant squared times the Laplacian of the temperature. This is the heat equation, and we're going to derive this using vector calculus identities in the next class. But for steady state, that means that this temperature distribution is stationary and it's not changing in time. So steady state means that this partial, partial T is zero. So it just means that the Laplacian of my temperature is equal to zero. Okay? And the way I like to think about that is the following. Let's say that I have some steel plate and it's not radiating or doing anything funny. It's like, you know, insulated. And I start out by applying a blowtorch to the center of this thing. Okay, so I have a blowtorch that's giving me a very, very hot distribution at the center of the blowtorch, and then I take the blowtorch away. What's going to happen as time goes to infinity as the system reaches steady state? It's eventually all going to become the same temperature, right? So this heat is going to diffuse and spread throughout the entire plate until eventually this whole thing is going to be one constant temperature, okay? And so what that means is that as time goes to infinity, or as this system reaches steady state, one solution of Laplace's equation is temperature equals a constant. Does that make, that actually makes sense, right? Because if I take temperature equals a constant, and I take the partials with respect to x, and I add them to the partials with respect to y, then they do actually satisfy Laplace's equation. So this satisfies Laplace's equation. Okay? So a constant temperature distribution is kind of a very simple or trivial solution of Laplace's equation. Um, I could have other solutions where I actually impose a temperature on the boundaries, and then you get some kind of linear gradient temperature distribution on this plate. That would also satisfy Laplace's equation. And we're going to go way more into detail with this later. Okay, and then the fourth, uh, the fourth physical equation that satisfies Laplace's equation is the potential flow we were talking about. And potential flow is going to be really, really useful for thinking about things like if I have fluid flow past an airfoil, how does that fluid move over that airfoil or over that surface? So if I was going to streamline a wing or a ship or a wind turbine blade, then I could use potential flow to figure out how the air is going to move over this surface. Okay? So if you've ever heard of streamlines for fluid flow, uh, streamlines are very intimately related to potential flow solutions. Okay? Okay, any questions about Laplace's equation or these kind of four canonical examples? Okay, so in the next lecture, I'm going to give you examples of potential flow. Like we're actually going to compute what a flow would do past an airfoil or past a cylinder or past a square object. Um, and then in the third lecture, I'm going to show you an example of a really, really useful potential flow that's actually used to model ocean, um, ocean currents. So it's called the double gyre. And a gyre just means a big rotating region. Um, so the idea is that I have this big kind of ocean gyre that's sloshing back and forth. Okay, so this could model, for example, the Pacific Ocean or the coupling between the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic. And this double gyre flow can be kind of approximated with potential flow, and it's going to allow us to study things like mixing in oceans.
Okay, so if you want to know how plant life or oxygen or temperature get mixed by ocean currents, this is a simple toy model built on potential flow that we can use to test our theories. So that's where we're going. Uh, we're going to kind of zoom in on potential flow. We're going to look at some you know, particularly useful examples of potential flow, show that they satisfy Laplace's equation, and then we're going to build this uh, mathematical model in MATLAB for ocean, uh, ocean sloshing. Okay, that's it for today. Um, on Wednesday, you will get a f the last midterm or the final exam for the class.